I think I'm going to just start by asking you, what first got you interested in Hank Williams' story? Um, I just was a big fan of country music growing up. I grew up kind of in the South, and I listened to country music. But I'm also a big fan of, of singer-songwriters mm -hmm. and writing in general. And I think Hank was a brilliant, brilliant writer. He had great influence over so many fantastic artists that have come after him. Uh, he had this really intense life that when you study it, you realize, oh my God, he lived so short a time and created such a great body of work. And I also was fascinated by the number of women in his life and how he was drawn <laughs> to these powerful women and how much trouble he had with them. And, and uh, I, you know, I just, I'm always interested in stories about men and women and mm -hmm. how hard it is to have a decent relationship. <laughs> So what would you say were like the quintessential components of Hank's life you wanted to get across in your film? Well, I, what I wanted to, what I didn't want to do is try to show what, uh, analyze as to how, why he was great. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to show him as a little boy having some epiphany that he wanted to be a star. What I really wanted to do was show uh, the relationships with these women in his life and how that influenced his music so the audience could see these really mundane and often banal personal experiences that he had and see how he translated those into really powerful songs because I think all of us have that have those relations we just can't turn it into the magic that he did I also wanted it to be about show business in a way that it, that that what happens to people when they're under that glare and mm -hmm. how the flower can wilt and we see it consistently I was just talking about the fact that Prince is only 57 years old and yeah. gone you know 57 pretty young age to be gone and then of course going down to other and um, I love the fact that he wrote these incredibly sad songs that were really 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 emotional I think I was always interested in that um, I love music so those were the things that were you know but really I wanted the film to be about the human condition mm -hmm. and about art portrait of an artist as a young man as opposed to here happened to, here's the story and this happened to this guy and this happened this happened this happened and would you say that's kind of a challenge of doing a biopic like there's a wealth of material in someone's life and it might be quite hard to pick what to and what not to include yes i think that anytime you're going to take on a real life that's the challenge for, and and you're always going to have people that want to see something that you don't want to do. To me, I don't. That's not my job. My job isn't to make everybody happy. My job is to try to do the best job of what I think I could do. If I thought I could do it better, differently, I would have done it. I I think the challenge is to do that. But I always prefer slices of a life as opposed to seeing the whole thing. The very rarely is there a life of, of that I'm interested in seeing what they were like as a young baby or a boy or a girl. I, I just don't feel like there's enough information there for me to believe that the writer can show you that that becomes that pertinent. Mm -hmm. Whereas I'm fascinated by these moments in time when Muhammad Ali was a guy named Cassius Clay who was 22 years old and wins this title and in six months goes from being this kid to become one of the most famous boxers in the entire world and just claims himself to be a, a, a Muslim. Mm -hmm. And that was like, you're talking about 1971, and people friggin lost their minds. But that, rather than see this whole life of this guy, rather, I, I would, I'd rather see those four months, so it's not like four, whatever, I just chose that because I happen to be a boxing fan. But, um, but it's always the challenge. It's, it's a challenge in any story. Where mm -hmm. do you start? Where do you end? Do you flash back? Do you, you know, those are the things. And you, I, to me, this was I, 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 this is exactly how I wanted to tell it. But it was really about the people. Mm -hmm. It's really about the people and their sort of the frailties of, that we have. And that kind of brings us to the cast. I mean, Tom Hiddleston and Elizabeth Olsen. I thought they were great in the Thank roles. Thank you. Were they your first choice for the cast? No, I mean, I didn't. No, I didn't really have a choice. Like the first choice, I just when I wrote it, I didn't really know who the hell would play Hank Williams. I just knew I wanted him to sing, and everybody said, "Oh, that's ridiculous." And I knew that the part of Audrey would be very, very hard to mm -hmm. cast because it's so easy to, to to for her to appear to be a shrew. And I knew I so. Tom became, Tom was just, you know, a, a vibe and good luck and happened to see him in a movie and think he looked like Hank Williams and then yeah. do a bunch yeah. of research and then get to know him and him to a spark to the story. And it was, you know, just brilliant luck that we 
bonded over it. And Elizabeth was sort of the same way. I, my casting person was talking about Elizabeth, and then I had watched a bunch of her stuff. And, and then when I met her, I had this, I'm really a gut person when I meet somebody, and particularly in casting, but in just in general. Mm -hmm. I always believe most people are if they're open to it. You can kind of see somebody and look at their face and know whether you like them or not. It's weird. But I met Lizzie, and I just thought she, she radiated such intelligence yeah. and such a keen sense of who she was that, that I felt like that would make that character. She could be all these rough things that she is in the film, but because she has that, you would understand her. And I think that's the brilliance of her performance, is that despite the fact that she plays a really rough character, I mean really rough, you still end up going like, well, you know, it wasn't that easy to live with that guy. Yeah. And that's what I love about what she did. I've got one last question. I've got to ask, I think it's a really bold choice to not put a score, to include a score in your oh. film. But Did I you like hear it. someone I else say that? You're the someone first person who's brought that up. Am I? I'm, no, I'm not the first person. Huh? The first person today, and really? maybe one of the first people who have ever actually asked me about, which I well, love I that you ask that. Brilliant. I think, is it to keep the focus on his music, or just talk me through that decision? Okay. Well, I love that you say that, because honestly, <laughs> there aren't a 10 movies that don't have a score. Yeah. Every time I had a really good composer and every time I put the music up uh, against it, I felt like I was pushing the emotion and I hate to do that. I, I hate to push emotion. I'm really, I'm, I go too far the other way. And when I, when I listen to it and listen, watch their performances, like the scene when he comes back to get her at the farmhouse and all you hear is the wind, Everybody would have put a score underneath that, especially it ends with a big kiss and all. And every time I did, I felt like, what do I need it for? They're so good. They're selling it. When he, she says she's having a baby, again, I had music underneath it. And every time I listened to it, I kept going, why do I do this? I'm pushing it too hard. I don't want to do it. And so I just made the decision, which everybody was like, that's it. Oh, my God, the studio, everybody. But I stuck by my guns. And... I think one day people like yourself, mm -hmm. which is really gratifying, will all will come to realize and appreciate that I did. But for the time being, you're one of the few who actually even brought it up. 